Hi, how you doing? It's Philip here with More Mana Gaming, and I had just made top 16 at uh, Argent Saga Championship 4 uh, with my deck, and I'm going to show you the profile. I got a 13th after Swiss, and I my record was X2-1, uh, drew the last round, so unfortunately I did, got out of topic contention, but still made top 16 for a good showing. And uh, let's go through it. So I played uh, Liam Kite, uh, sort of the boogeyman of the format just because of how powerful the singular cards are. Uh, but a lot of versatility, uh, not a very fun deck to play because you're really just attacking, but uh, although it's a linear strategy, the plays to get where you need to go are pretty, um, pretty complex. Um, so for towers, I have basic towers. I think the newer towers don't really have a place in the meta as of yet, especially when aggro is probably one of the more pre prevalent decks. You don't want to trade your wind tower for a ramp, and the light tower um, could sometimes whiff if... Uh, you know, you just got ahead of your opponent attacking, so. Uh, for Argent Creatures, I played three Shard Beast, uh, Radiant Shard Beast. What we were scared of was just not having enough creatures in the deck. The, the deck is super creature light. Um, overall, more of a hindrance because some of the more powerful plays are bigger. Uh, probably some card I, I would look to replace. Probably one of the more weaker cards of the deck. Um, just a one-drop attacker, pretty good, you know. Does hinder your plays like late game. But having another guy to suit up with the Quickness Dagger in the middle of the game is really, really strong. Um, then I played uh, 302 uh, Reprobloom. Bloom. This card is insane. It, it like, forces you to play this deck because it's so silly. Or, like, maybe Rain variants or stuff. Um, very unfun card to play with. Very unfun card to play against. Um, way too powerful. Should be banned. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't. This is why we played this deck. Um... It, it was it was just like the the show of the weekend is when your opponent gets to play this card on two unhindered, and uh, in this in this deck uh, we maximize gears so that you can do it on your turn and then do it on your opponent's turn so you have five attackers when it comes back to you, and that's the like the craziest thing, and you could just get so much advantage off of Liam off of Rain for just cracking towers and killing people and like you attack with this first so they don't target this with their. If you hit the fire tower, the wind tower, and it stays, and it gets more attackers, and super unfair card, very not fun to play with, and yeah, probably shouldn't be in the deck. But still, a very powerful card, and kind of forces you to play a deck like this, because of uh, how strong it is in the meta. Uh, then we played uh, three Bone Scavenger, so what we thought was there was like a triangle in the format with Liam, Ergon, and Blue Dex. Uh, Blue Dex can kind of beat uh, Liam Kite, like more close to like a 50-50 matchup. Uh, Liam beats Ergon like close to 100% because of this card and uh, Ergon beats the blue decks and so we wanted to maximize the ability to, to be able to beat Ergon on play 3. It's a good one drop attacker which is nice. Um, you can suit it up for cheaply because it is one mana and it could get really big on its own. Also against like any graveyard centric decks uh, it does apply a lot of pressure because your opponent um, in the early game can't do much with their mana so they can't like Yami and stack and you get to fight over with Bone Scavenger. A lot of times you don't re even activate its effect because just the summon and applying pressure with your other creatures is good enough. But um, <clears throat> you're taxing your, their mana on the attacks. Uh, but it is just good to control the graveyard for like later in the game. Like if they drop Allurements or stuff like that, you can take them out and then not have to worry about Yami weight down the line, which is really nice. Uh, Sided out a lot against the blue decks, honestly, but it's still a, a decent card. Uh, then we played one Eccentric Visitor. This card was actually... So I played one Eccentric Visitor. Uh, this card was pretty much like an All-Star of the Weekend. Uh, a lot of times you use your Kite to bounce your O2 uh, defensively or even offensively to get uh, more attackers if you run out of, if you don't have Gears. And the Corona Shard is like a, like really your only removal spell in this deck. So it's like taxed on a lot of like powerful plays. But the Visitor makes it so that doesn't happen. Also like... They need to win the game eventually by cracking tower, so it turns on the visitor. Kite bounce is really strong for killing the game. Like if people have Sola or the Light Tower, Kite Spirit answers it really nicely. Um, and yeah, so this was just a really really good card. I would want to see more of it um, during some of the games, but I didn't want to draw it. That's why we had it at one. Uh, but overall, a really strong card. Pretty much an All Star of the weekend. <clears throat> uh, then we have three uh, Corn Squires. Again, we're low crown, low to the card, uh, low to the ground deck, and we thought that the actual like one mana gears weren't that bad uh, because they do act as two creatures when you have bloom. And worst case scenario, lets you attack over bloom in the mirror match. Uh, basically, we kind of made our decks like hedge against all the decks, but really have a focus towards the mirror. Um, 
because we thought that was the strongest deck. So this lets you search for the one-drop gears that really give you an edge in the mirror, and it's just another attacker that's one mana. You know, it's constant theme is you just want to have low to the ground creatures. Um, very versatile because if it dies, it gets something. Uh, good creature to start the game with too. Uh, then I play one Iskandar. Uh, this card is the bee's knees, phenomenal. Um, great. Uh, it's cool. People can interact with it before, but if you have War Room, it makes it really tricky. Um, I won so many games on the back of this. I lost games in the mirror match on the back of this. This card's overall a super strong all star. Uh, needs to be in almost every Liam deck that plays Gears. And yeah, not much to say. This card's legendary Haymaker, Argent Rare, you know? It's like. Uh, and that was all the creatures, not many creatures, but uh, you know, you, you really win the game on the back of your gears, and so we have a big gear package. So we played 3 Caliber, the protection gear, uh, super, super strong because you can just protect your guys from anything. So whenever they try to corona you or kite bounce or a lot of the game interaction is fought on the equips uh, because they are so powerful. Even just getting the attack and attacking is super strong. Uh, so Caliber, probably the best gear out right now. Or, well like contention for the best gear. Uh, then probably the second best gear or the best gear. Uh, three shar Shining Star Dagger. This is the quickness so like all your cheap attackers become threats and it gets 500 to crack those towers that you don't need to boost with which is like really really strong. Uh, pretty much in the middle of the game the way the game plays out is every time you crack a tower you just get one of these. You summon a guy, shoot up a guy, attack and you can like crack four towers in a turn with these. Uh, super super strong. Uh, it sucks to them early game because you want to pitch gears to Liam's effect and they're this but uh, you can mitigate that with the War Rooms, so super, super strong gear. Uh, then, because we played three Corm Squire, we played uh, three standard Star Sword. The idea behind this was we equip it to any of our guys to kind of attack over O2 in like mirror matches or any O2 based deck. And um, even though they get tokens, we can deal with those throughout the line because the tokens without Liam can't really pop towers unless multiple attack into one, and then. That those two are attacking on one, and if they don't, if they crack one of the interactable towers, the thousand attack towers. You get to deal with the tokens themselves. So our objective was to suit up maybe our O2 or any other creature we play and attack over their O2, and then worry about the tokens later. And this helped a lot. Also, it's another gear to pitch, and it's very it's searchable with our three corn squires, so that they're never dead. A cool thing interaction is with um, corn room with zero mana. So like, you can activate your your. O2 by equipping it with this for zero mana, and then you just have the gear to pitch on your like on your turn or your opponent's turn to have maximize the amount of attack because you have really really strong. Uh, then one Longinus, we wanted to diversify the gear threats. Um, the Longinus was cool because it does like pesky blockers get in the way. You can snipe those against the blue decks. Uh, in the mirror, it lets you eat up the tokens from um, Bloom, or if they have a Scavenger, or if they have you know Shard Beast with some damage on it, or if they try to trade creatures. This is really nice. Uh, the thousand really never came up too much, but the destroy like the deal fifteen hundred is really, really strong, and overall a good one one of flex spot. Uh, another flex spot we had was the hammer. Um, the hammer is really nice because uh, against blue decks, they do have a lot of blockers. With phantasmal guards, uh, some of them play the two drop uh, azure Sur guardian. Some of them play the harpist, and those kind of just get in the way. Also against any deck that plays. Uh, some of the Ergon decks are still playing Devourment or Guardhound, and this kind of lets you set up plays where you can just kind of eat them. Uh, if you have Yuki, or if you have any target attacker with a target attack gear, uh, and you have War Room, lets you set up like you can knock down your opponent's all, whole board if they have blockers up, which is really, really nice. came up a lot of times where I like, killed a Juggernaut because I was so pumped up and then still could like attack a tower or crack it, or like... They have Phantasmal Guards, eat the Phantasmal Guard, eat the Phantasmal Guard, like, eat another guy with my target attacker for one attack. Like, kind of wild in that case. Um, most of the board central decks is such a play to the board really nicely. Overall, really good gear, uh, good as another flex gear. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that was the gears, some number of gears. Uh, then we played, because we're a gear-based deck, we did play three Corm War Room. Uh, the ability to make the, the gears cheaper was really, really strong because you can play them in tangent with your little guys. So when you're at like six mana, you play one of these and then you reduce the cost of the quickness gears by one, which is really nice. And you just get to really just a crack on your post board. Also, the, the looming threat of having um, Caliber whenever your opponent activates one of those interactable spells is, is really, really nice to get that off of nowhere. Also, like behind Iskandar, it's more, uh, I guess, interaction with like monster removal or more quickness with other guys. So it's, Really a good way to end the game out of nowhere sometimes. Uh, I can see cutting down on this. 
honestly, but the card was just so good when it was good, and it was, like, not bad when it was mediocre. So, three is, I think, the right number. Uh, then our tech to beat the mirror. We played two finishing rays. The idea behind this was if your opponent opens O2 and you don't, or they get ahead on board because of, like, trades because you don't have gears, you don't open gears to pump with Liam, and they, they trade into your guys favorably, or they open, like, a target attack gear, like, because we kind of thought people would be doing the same thing. So if they open a shard sword and just aren't able to target attack, we could wipe the board. Also, because we have gift, at any point in time of the game, we can gift, and they'll, like, think we're gifting for O2 or something like that, and we can hide it behind the finishing ray. Uh, two was so that the first one clears, like, the O2 and the creatures, and if they ever have any other creatures in their hand, the second one would finish it off. Uh, worked, like, beautifully every time. Against the blue decks, they have the uh, unkillable guys like Kara or uh, Magical Giganth, and this kills it. Uh, against Ergon, they can get crazy boards with Hoena and, like, Demon and Cat Demon. This is a way to out those cards. And in the mirror, like I said, they get ahead on board with O2 and other stuff in this outset. Super good card. Um, we decided to throw one because it's so strong. Uh, then we played two Short Sword Nova. We thought, because the mirror match was so prevalent, outs cards in the mirror match for cheap. Once you attack with a quickness gear, it's on the guy and it doesn't really do anything. So Short Sword Nova can use that gear in fact, to kill it. Or one of the target tech gears, we target over the guy, we charge one over another creature to kill it. Uh, deals with the early blockers or even the wind uh, even the light tower. And overall, just really good, uh, cheap interaction for uh, the mirror match, which is what it's the most prevalent in. Also, against blue, it allows you to get chip shots because you can kill their phantasmal guards, which is really, really nice, so that they're not pesky and they don't get in the way. <clears throat> uh, really cool with the Quorum Sky because it gets the uh, shard, uh, the shard sword, so that, like you have a constant flow of gears. Uh, and that's all the not that's all the yellow and argent cards. And then for green, we play three Fabrials Gift. It's a demonic tutor, stretches any card in your deck, so it's, it's just additional copies of every card. Uh, it's cool because on turn two, if you don't have O2, you can search O2 instead of for turn three O2 with like you know protection or an equip spell of some nature, or you can search for the finish array like we talked about. Uh, let you search for any other threat in your deck, maybe Iskandar, late game, stuff like that. Really, really strong card. Probably would always play it in three in any green deck. Uh, then we played three Kaze, like we talked about before. We thought the mirror was so prevalent, and this is like one of the best cards in the mirror because uh, you guys are just going back and forth, haymaking for towers, and eventually you get to a spot where you get free cards are always better. And protect, preventing damage, like they go all into an attack, you just cause it, and now they're kind of left like defenseless because they tap out for quickness gears and stuff like that. And Jordan cards no slouch. Uh, also makes favorable trades when people try to attack into your guys and you just turn off their damage. And then you just pump with Liam and then their guy dies, which is really, really nice. Like, uh, like a light tower or something like that. So super strong card are the other three of green. And then the two of is Guiding Winds. This is more like just a protection spell. Uh... Basically, honestly, I never even used it for O2 because Liam's effect was so strong. I used it a lot for Iskandar, which was really nice because, like, by the time you get to Iskandar, you already hit the interactable tower, so Iskandar comes, kills two towers. Um, you always try to leave the dark one for last anyway, and then you just guide wins, drop it down again, and kill two more towers, which was really, really nice. Uh, and that's the main deck, 40 cards in the main deck. Uh, like I said, we geared our deck to beat the mirror match and uh, our main deck. And that was it. And our side is weird side. Uh, I'll show you as we get into it. But uh, we decided a finishing rate for all the decks that um, stick to the board. So mirror matches, uh, any pesky blue decks with a lot of the uh, unkillable blockers. Um, any deck that really, like, when they go first, they can make a crazy board. Like the rain decks and stuff like that. We decided to send is really, really nice. Uh, we decided two Akaris when we needed instant speed guys. If they had a lot of board removals, like let's say they were playing X yellow. Um, so they have finishing rays or stuff like that, or we needed to fight. Um, basically, pretty much the blue decks or even the mirror match. It was just more more ways to put out guys. They're guardians, so you don't lose the game when you get low, and they're just an instant speed way to put on guys. So it's really nice. Uh, and then we started three three Yugi's for the mirror. Uh, honestly, these cards could have been the main, but I didn't miss them at all uh, because uh, I did play a lot of Liam. But the the games I didn't play against Liam, Yuki was just that and testing a lot so we moved it to the board because Liam is really the only one that can activate it because we don't play uh, Raging Shard Beast and the card did what it did you know when we drew and they cracked towers it came down and commanded you know just demanded answers and just commanded the board and versus everything else's subpar so it didn't come in but really an all-star and the aggro mirrors and needed if you play yellow 
And then we had a really, really spicy idea. Um, so the way the triangle worked, we kind of lost the blue deck, so we thought if we can side into it, maybe a different color or a different arch type, uh, a more controlling arch type, uh, we would have better game twos and threes. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we sided into Luna, because uh, the black has a lot of discard, a lot of reanimate. So blue, with their bounce effects, wouldn't want to bounce any of their cards, and they don't have hard removal. And if they did get to finish your radius, we did have some recursion. Um, so with the Luna, we brought in three Demons of the Evil Eye. Uh, obviously, this is just crucial discard versus the uh, the blue decks. You call any card that um, is really a problem. Uh, finishing Ray when you have a crazy board. Chronostasis before mm -hmm. turn six. Uh, you know, any of the bounce spells that really just out your board. And then they don't want to bounce it. It's 3k, it trades with uh, Juggernaut really well. And they don't. They have a hard time like just dealing with it because they don't have hard removal. And they don't want to put it back in your hand because it just comes down, draws your cards, gets through the answers. Really, really strong card. Uh, one of the reasons to play black and more so one of the reasons that gives you your control matchup in a favor. Uh, and then we played three Vengeance. Um... It's just a more enhanced version of Demon because you don't need to call a card. You guarantee hit a card. 4K, so even if they have some number of Hollow Towers, it gets over the um, Juggernaut. has Destroyer, so it ends the game very quickly. Like, they almost go out of their way to make sure they never take an attack from it because the, the hand disruption and the attack from it is too strong. Uh, it's huge. Another reason to side into hand destruction versus the deck, uh, just because they can't deal with it. Yeah, it's just super strong. And then we decided to uh, Recurring Shadows as the last two black cards. Just because um, we needed recursive ways. We thought that like if we if they somehow finishing ray us, like we call Chronostasis, they get a finishing ray or vice versa or something like that. Uh, we're able to put it back in our hand to reuse it again. It does let us reuse our little creatures if we need more attackers. Or just reuse our, our bigger Haymaker cards over and over. Because, you know, the first uh, Golem Adventure is good. The second one is like insane and the third one's probably game and like if there's only three in the deck we'll never get that but because we have copies of return and shadows we're able to get to three because technically you have five so super super strong card um yeah i actually enjoyed it i did play against uh one blue deck uh while i ended up losing because i wasn't able to finish the game in time uh this this plan was really, really strong and i recommend it versus any like if you're playing an aggro deck versus the control meta where you can't beat the control decks this is definitely an avenue to take like it wouldn't probably have been wrong to start Liam Luna if I thought like only control decks uh, were the meta. And then just uh, as an adjustment for the Luna itself, uh, we played one Corona because I didn't side deck any shards, seven Argent shards and two Zephyrs. Uh, in those those grindy matchups with the blue decks, you don't mind your um, Argent shards coming in tapped. Um, so but we didn't want a full max out on three because on turn five you do want to play a demon. So if you hit this early, you have a low chance to hit the rest of them. So we only played three because it is uh, two because it is crucial in the mirror match, uh, and we didn't have room in our side deck to actually side more shards. Uh, so that was kind of like a concession right there, a deck building concession. And overall, the deck was super super strong because of O two. O two was so strong that it kind of felt like I had to play the deck. And unfortunately, I wish I did a little better. Uh, but the deck choice I think was solid and it was just a good deck.